I did football uh, management because I loved it and um, I loved helping people. I loved developing footballers and trying to help change their lives. But I wasn't doing it necessarily for me or for the money. So when I came out of it, I was like, well, let me reset and see what I want to do. There might be something else that comes up in my life that, and a direction that takes me somewhere totally different. And how did you know when you were ready? Uh, probably the harder I worked, a couple of hours a day at the start, I'm just going to write this training session down to probably three, four hours a day, to five, six, to seven, eight. And then almost it was up doing that. And then that was all I was doing. <laughs> so that was when I knew I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, I, I'm doing this because I want to get back in. And when I get back in, I want to be, I want to be good. And then an opportunity comes up and it is at Newcastle United. Can you explain to us the process of how, how the job came to be? My, my, my unique selling point, if you want to call it that, what I think I do best is, is coach and develop players you know training is going to be hard training is going to be intense training is going to be detailed we're going to have a clear philosophy there'll be no hiding places how do you interpret trust and how do you build it and develop it players have to believe that you love them players are only going to play for you uh, to their, their best levels if you have that trust between you the manager loves me so give us an example then of what you would do now differently well the first thing i did at, at, at newcastle and you just reminded me is well, Eddie, first of all, thank you very much. Welcome to High Performance. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure and honour to be here with you both. Oh, it's very kind of you. You know how we start these podcasts because um, you've heard a few of them. What is your version of high performance? My version of high performance is getting the very, very best out of the people you have. Um, I think consistency is absolutely key to that. Um, and it's, as a football manager, it's getting the best out of a group of players and getting them to, to play better than they think they're capable of. Very nice. But also it comes down to you as well. And I want to really focus on sort of your experience after you left Bournemouth and arrived here at Newcastle. So for people that are listening to this and, and don't know the story, we had a conversation on the phone. Maybe, would it be about a year ago? Yeah, I think it was about a year ago. And you kindly sort of reached out to me because you were listening to High Performance, right? Yeah. And I always wanted to then have a conversation. No, actually, if you remember, I said, why don't you come on the podcast? And do you remember what your answer was to that? I think I refused. Didn't I? <laughs> you refused. You said, wait till, I, wait till I'm back in the game. Because this is when you were having your year out. And so I wondered whether you would be happy to approach this interview from the perspective of what you learned in that year when you weren't managing, rather than focusing on everything that you learn when you're in the game. Yeah, I mean, I think at that time, I think it was during lockdown. So... The first thing I did when we got relegated was sort of mourn and, and, and sort of grieve that thing that had happened, that failure in my eyes. Um, and it took me a period to sort of come out of that malaise that I was in for, for a, a while. And then immediately I was like, right, I want to analyze what happened and sort of look at myself and go, right, how can I come back a much better version of the manager that's just left the game? And part of my learning then was to go and listen to your podcast, which I'd never really heard of. I stumbled across it and I was hooked straight away. I was like, these are amazing. And you were both amazing. And uh, I wanted to reach out and just tell you that you'd really helped me in that, in that period. So can we go in then to that period that you spent out of the game, that year out of the game? You've come with some, some notes, right? I asked you, I reached out and asked whether you wouldn't mind just coming with five of your biggest lessons from that time out of the game and how they sit with you now. So how should we start this? Yeah, well, I think um, just I didn't have a plan. So I, I, as I said, I'd, I'd come out of that thing, um, the, the, the failure, the relegation and thought, right, how, how did that happen? What, what, what did I do wrong? Um, I'm very honest and open with myself. And I asked people that I know to sort of critique me and uh, give me feedback. And I did it myself as well. And I thought these are the areas that I think I need to improve. And how do I go about doing that? And part of that was was education so improving me was a big part of what I had to do uh, I'd just gone through a really intense period I don't know how long it was 12 years in management where you don't get time to even blink so you're working you're reacting you're planning preparing but you're not sort of investing in yourself and working on any potential weaknesses that you might have what did you find then well, I looked at it and thought that there's definite things that I'd neglected through work that I had to really, really focus on. So my my body of work that existed was all on in books. 
So I had a tower of diaries where I'd put every training session, recorded it, and that was it. That that was my body of work. So if you had asked me a question on how do you deal with uh, problem players or how do you deal with this situation that occurs in your job, I wouldn't have been able to give you an answer. Really? Well, yeah, because it would have been in here, but it wouldn't have necessarily been uh, something that I could refer to or a body of work behind it. So I spent hour after hour after hour in my study uh, uh, digesting all my training sessions, coding them, putting them into groups. Um, and that just happened by chance. I just started fiddling around and then I was like, I've got to get this done. So now if you ask me to find a training session or how do you play against this type of team, I'd be able to uh, find it straight away. See, that reminds me of um, the story attributed to Jose Mourinho. I did that when he left Barcelona before he went into uh, coaching, he talks about that was the period where he collated what he called his Bible, his, his methodology that he was going to implement when he went into clubs. And some of it was around the social, the, the tactical, the psychological and the technical side of it. So what kind of categories did you include when you were starting to code these 12 years of experience? Well, it, it started with the training sessions. So it started with the basics in possession, out of possession, and it just grew legs. It just grew so many different bits off of it. And I was like, and I, and the more I started to enjoy the process and I thought this is going to help me, the, the more um, intense it got. So I'd gone right through that. And then it branched into all the other areas of the job. So everything that comes with being a football manager, so dealing with players, dealing with the media, um, board level, uh, supporters, all my philosophies around how I want to work. What am I going to do on Mondays, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Um, things that I'd never, again, I'd had it all in here, but I didn't have anything um, to refer to. You know, the brain can only take so much information. So um, I felt this it is my Bible now. It's, it's something I refer to every day and use consistently. And away from the, the football side, the tactical side, what did you want to learn about yourself and improve about yourself on a on a personal level, which helps you with your job? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, on, on a on a personal level, it was about improving my my knowledge tactically. So I was um, I'd played near enough one system, not through the whole of my management career, but majority. I, I wanted to be consistent with what I did. Uh, I wanted my players to understand what was required of them. So I. Um, I thought, right, I have to go away and I have to try and watch people work. I have to try and improve uh, my tactical understanding, my my delivery. So even breaking down half-time team talks, full-time team talks, um, everything that covers my job, I wanted to look in depth and then find a few strategies and things that would help me when I got back in. So what did you find that you were doing really well? Because I appreciate that the analysis was what you could do better, but... I think a big part of this kind of analysis is also acknowledging you were doing things very successfully for a long period. Yeah, I suppose from from that side, I'm not so good at that. So I would, uh, uh, I think a lot of my training sessions, when I look back at them, are very good. Um, so I was looking back at things and I think, oh, I remember doing that about 10 years ago because I had it all on film. So I was like, that was really good. I was, and I haven't done that since. So I'm going to bring that one back out. <laughs> you know, so you're, yeah. you're rediscovering things that you'd forgotten. Um, so I'd say majority of my training, I was I was pleased with what I was delivering, um, but it was a whole host of other things that go into the job that there were sort of blank spaces that I needed to fill. Like what, for example? Well, like, like I said earlier, like um, you know, if you said to me, "Well, what would you? What was your philosophy at half time? How, how do you?" And I'd be like, "Well, I just help my players." But how do you help your players? And and do you have a different ways of talking with your players? Are you going to do it in ones and twos? You can do it in units. You're going to do it all eleven. Where are you going to do it? That sounds obvious, but yeah, yeah. so it was analyzing, breaking that down. Things that I hadn't done at that level before. Um, I wanted to make sure that I had strategies and things that I could strategically bring out when I needed them. So, give us an example then of what you would do now differently at half time than what you maybe would have done before this kind of introspection. Well, the first thing I did at, at, at Newcastle, and you just reminded me, is um, I set up a different area. So the the change room is obviously the change room. You'd expect most t talks to be done in the change room, but I almost wanted that to be the player space. So there's a 
there was well, actually there wasn't a room. We created a room, so we knocked down a few walls and, and built a, wall, a room next to the change room. And when I do my halftime team talk, I take the, the lads in there, and in there's a couple of tactics board and a TV. And it's a much more well, it's a separate space, so you try and get the lads' attention yep. uh, and their focus rather than they're fiddling around with strappings and, and things in around their area, which they would normally do. And where did you learn that from? I didn't actually. That was just an idea that came to me. Is that me. right? Yeah. It, so it, then how do you work out? Because obviously you had a year out of the game, right? So there's a million ideas coming all the time. How did you decide which ideas stuck and which ones were kind of discarded along the journey? Well, I think you're right. And, and if you don't want to, I didn't want to change everything because a lot of what I'd done had worked over a long period of time. So it was a case of really looking at, as I said, the lot of training sessions that I did, I loved and looking back, there was a lot that I'd forgotten that I wanted to bring back in. Um, so you've got to be very careful that you don't throw out the good stuff and bring mm. in stuff that you're, you're yeah, not yeah. so sure about. And also it's got to be you. It's got to be coming from your ideas and your method, not things you've seen from other people that you copy. That doesn't work. So it's got to be uh, fully embraced uh, my work. And um, I did go out and I was very fortunate enough to see a lot of teams work around the world. Um, I think I, I worked it out earlier. I think it was about eight, eight different clubs around the world that I, I went to to see and learn and you know that in terms of it is like gold dust because you're mm. you very rarely get a chance to do that when you're working. so when you go into these clubs like what do you look for you know like when you've been invited in as a visitor that beyond seeing like the surface level of like a training session what other kind of things are you looking for on those visits i think the first thing you're looking for is the culture of the the, the place so not not so much the training sessions as such because i think they're pretty much universal. Yeah. Um, everyone likes to think they're unique and different, but the reality is they're probably similar things going on. But the culture and and everything behind the scenes is what you rarely get to see. So I remember going to see Saracens, going, being visited and to see Saracens, Saracens Rugby Club and the culture there. Now rugby is different to football, but immediately it was, it was different. It was a different kind of um, feeling, uh, very uh, coach orientated, very uh, hands-on, a lot of laptops around the training pitch. Um, I remember one of the players leading, I hope they don't mind me saying this, but one of the players leading a team meeting and uh, about the opposition. So he'd been watching the opposition, not the coaches, and he was telling the players what to expect. So some really eye-opening things that, um, that can only, again, would I take everything that I saw? No, because some things wouldn't yeah. relate to football, but there was a, a culture there that was hugely successful and very powerful. I'd love to delve into some of the stuff you've got written down that you've brought with you today. Would you mind just sort of talking us through some of the stuff that you've you've written and brought with you from from this period? Um, what does it start with? Well, the, the first thing: why did I fail? Assess my strengths and weaknesses. Well, let's. Why did I fail? Let's. Should we? Um, do you? So well, you see it as one, a failure, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I let's saw be that clear as, about that to start with. Yeah, I saw that as a failure. Yeah, a, a problem, personal failure. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Um, I think when you're managing. Uh, I, you know, my my feeling is that you take ultimate responsibility for what happens, um, and I felt that yeah, I didn't do my job probably for the first time as a manager. I'd, I'd uh, not not um, not delivered what I felt I could deliver, right. and I felt I needed to take accountability for that for myself, not for anyone else, for myself to go right. Okay, then why and why so many different? There's no one reason yeah um loads so of different... i'm interested in a bit about you feeling that you were no longer delivering because i imagine and i've never been a football manager but you're at bournemouth and you're still doing what you've always done and you're still as dedicated and you're still not sleeping at night because you're worried about result so at what point are you not doing or not delivering what you like letting yourself down like did you change what you were doing did you lose the drive get disillusioned no none of those things no right. i i worked you know, I can look myself in the mirror and say it wasn't through lack of effort right. or commitment or a anything to do with anything connected with the job. Um, but clearly, from what I felt, the results and the performances weren't what they could have been. And ultimately, I think you have to then take responsibility for that as the leader of, of what's going on. Um, but then, as I say, there's no one reason as to why anything doesn't work. There's probably 15 to 20 little things that go to make that big performance not right would you mind sharing a few because i think for people that aren't in the game running any business 
this is really helpful for them for when they find that things aren't going as well as they used to? Um, well, that's a difficult one because it, it, it can be quite personal. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a difficult one for me to say, right, this happened and this happened yeah. and this happened. I'm just trying to, you know, that's something that I haven't, I haven't written down. Um, but ultimately I felt, I felt, yeah, I felt that I didn't deliver and I, I could have done things in hindsight and hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I could have done things with hindsight to have changed that, our destiny. And I think, but I think that's a healthy thing to go through because I think if you don't, then what happens next time? So when you, cause again, I'm fascinated by almost like these little threads that eventually you pull them all and the whole thing starts to unravel. What are the kind of threads now that you'd be alert to in a new club that you go if i start to see like a little fissure there or a little crack started i would deal with that a lot faster what kind of examples would you well i i the, the, i think the core basics of a team like you need the team to be committed you need the team to uh play for the team not for the individual within right. the team um you know the core sayings of around teamwork if they don't exist, you're not going to be successful. Right. So they're, you know, they're warning signs that the team is not where it needs to be. And then you need to do things that, that impact that. Now, there are other things that maybe sometimes are beyond your control, injuries and lo lots of different things that you don't necessarily have control over. That's why I say it's never just one thing. Yeah. There's always a host of reasons. Yeah. But overall, I think if you don't take accountability for them, you're not doing your, your job as the leader. What's next on your list of learnings so then then it was about improving me so the first section really was improving me and that comes back to all the visits that i i undertook to different people different teams um, but I, I i tried to do it slightly differently so um and again this is organically it wasn't me beforehand thinking this is just in the process so i visited and i didn't realize this until i wrote it down two ceos three owners of football clubs because i wanted to see a different perspective mm -hmm. i wanted to go to the owners to say what do you like in a manager what don't you like in a oh, manager? I like that and what yeah. surprised you from the answers you got then um how deeply they thought about their appointments um how much they the personality of the manager also played a hugely important part in their support or not support for the, yeah. for the manager um it's a it's a complex thing i think you know that human uh, relationship you have with someone I think if they genuinely like you and think you're working hard for for them and uh, they will give you a little bit longer. So what about managing upwards? Because again, when we interviewed Frank Lampard on this, he spoke about just that importance of alignment of not just thinking it's about managing the team downwards, it's about managing the decision makers above it. What kind of tips did these CEOs and club owners give you about how they like to be communicated with and the nature of that communication well yeah there's a couple of interesting things that spring to mind so one is honesty so even if you make a complete mess as long as you hold your hands up and and, and take it and admit it right they won't hold it against you well the guys that I, exactly <laughs> well. I spoke yeah. to they said they wouldn't they said they wouldn't but that they, they would uh respect that yeah rather than trying to hide it and, and if you try and hide something anyway that, that they'll soon smell it out and and know what's going on so I thought that I thought that was a really important thing because in football you're always you're making so many decisions you're not going to get every single one right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some honesty I think was all they they were looking for. Um, that was one of the key things. Very nice. And where did you go to next on your journey um, of discovery? Yeah. So then I, I went to a couple of individuals and there's some really fascinating ones. So yeah, as I said, a, a boxing. I went to uh, Shane McGuigan's boxing club. That was fascinating. Saracens um, and Barry Hearn. So I went to see Barry in his in his house and i did think it might be interesting just to read a few couple of his quotes out because yeah, i wrote them down just in note form but when i was looking back today before coming here i was like wow they're unbelievable so it's <laughs> better to be lucky than good looking tell the truth pressure is only felt by those that fail uh, think poor life ends in tears so enjoy the rest of it life doesn't change sitting on a sofa um Avoid being, uh, avoid being a secret. Show how good you are. From, uh, shout how good you are from the rooftops. Can't read my own writing here. Um, imagine you're a new car. What separates you from the others? Um, when having a meeting, know your opponent's weakness. So just, just some amazing things that from, from Barry, who was fascinating. I spent about three hours with him. Yeah. Um, and obviously he'd owned a, a football club and 
had so many different aspects of of sport in his life. He was uh, absolutely brilliant with me. And I loved that there was another one he gave me as well. He said, life is like a game of snakes and ladders. He said, people are very good at going up the ladders, um, but they don't react so well going down the snakes. Yeah. Which uh, just a, a few little things that did just make you think, um, I thought he was a fascinating character. And I think it's easy for people to deride those sort of little pithy quotes, right? You know, if I ever put that on my Twitter, I might get a meme of Ricky Gervais returned to me or whatever. But the truth is that there is actually fascinating learning in all of these little things. And I think you were smart enough here, not just to think, right, I need to look in football, but I need to look out of the game. I need to look in, in different areas and different roles. When you started to do this, had you already emotionally put to bed what happened at Bournemouth and you were you were already looking forwards? I think it took took me a few months, to be honest. I think it took me about three months to raise my head above the surface yeah. and then think, right, now I've, I've got to get going again. Um, and I didn't really know that that would, would happen. And I didn't know if I'd want to get going again at, at, at the end of it, but I did. Um, did just think, going back to Barry, so yeah, I, I have to say, those th those were things he spoke about. They were mm. stories he yeah. elaborated on. They weren't just quotes yeah, he wrote yeah. off to me. They were stories, and that, that's the thing I wrote down from it. But they all had a meaning to him, nice. so they weren't just flaky and, quotes. And that bit about not knowing whether you'd go again, was there a... Was there ever a point where you thought maybe I wouldn't go back into management after after that experience? Yeah, there was because I I, I did football uh, management because I loved it and um, I loved helping people. I loved developing footballers and trying to help change their lives. But I wasn't doing it necessarily for me or for the money. So when I came out of it, I was like, well, let me reset and see what I want to do. There might be something else that comes up in my life that, and a direction that takes me somewhere totally different. I then realized very quickly <laughs> that football is in me and it's not going to leave anytime soon. So, um, as I said, it took me three or four months to sort of get over that and then go, right, now I'm, I'm going to get going again in football and in football management. So we get quite a few queries from people that listen to this podcast that find themselves at a similar crossroads to what you described of debating whether they're on the right career path or whether they need to pivot and go in a different direction. What kind of advice or tips did you learn about this period of introspection that others could maybe apply of how they go about asking themselves that question? Well, I think I stayed away from football um, for that time. So in that three, four months, I, I, I really did stay away from it. I don't think I did any media. And my first sort of coming out of it was the media work. And I, um, I felt I was asked to do lots of, of different things like Jake saying, and I, I refused everything. And I think then the first thing I did was Monday night football. So I sort of stayed away intentionally to see if I missed it and I wanted to do it again. Right. Rather than sort of surround, like going to game straight away or yep. going here, there and everywhere straight away. I, I, I sort of maybe on a subconscious level thought, no, yeah, stay away, see if you miss it. So almost that absence was, was key, I think. Okay. That yeah. reminds us of when we interviewed Matthew McConaughey. And he spoke about when he makes a decision on a movie, he completely commits to it and then lives as if he's going to do it and sees how that feels with him. And then he'll decide not to do it and give himself at the same period of time to see how that feels. And then he said at the end of that process, he's got real clarity of, of his decision. Yeah, well, I, I can sort of relate to that. And I think the media work was very important then because then it, you know, I enjoyed doing that I enjoyed analyzing the games before having because I wanted to do it properly so as Jake will know you spend a lot of time then planning and preparing the teams you're going to watch so you can give good feedback hopefully to the people that are watching so then that that stoked my fire on different levels and it helped me with a lot of what I was doing then later on with the the work and what what came next in your in your work so then the podcast and and books so I loved the Sir Clive Woodward podcast with you guys I, I was fascinated by him and I'd met Sir Clive a few times and he done, did a presentation for my players at Bournemouth and the Paul McGinley book that you kindly sent yeah. me uh, which had a couple of unbelievable quotes on there and sections in his book if anyone hasn't read that then please do it's about the Ryder Cup and his uh, the way he formulated his team to try and win that cup. Do you remember what stood out to you from from Paul's book? Oh god you're testing my memory now I, I can't remember which one it was I sent you a, I, sent, I think I sent you a picture of of what did this mean? Because I think there was a, a quote next to a rock or a mountain or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Do you remember that? It was um, it was about the storm will come. Yeah, 
he basically he had yeah. a in his book he had a thing on the wall didn't he and it was it was an image of a huge cliff face and the sea hitting it and he was basically saying to his players like expect the storm the storm will come but knowing we talk about this a lot on the podcast you know if you can expect it you can accept it and it stops in that case golf golfers in your case footballers from being derailed from the storm when it arrives yeah and that probably resonated me from where i was in my life at that moment so i was intrigued by by that and then you sent me the book and i thought the book was absolutely brilliant um so the podcast and and reading books because it was at a time with covid as well so i couldn't always get out and about like i i'd want yeah. to so then i had to seek learning from home um so yeah i think that was improving me was was massive and as i say a lot of the you know, I went abroad as well. I went to Spain twice. I went to Denmark, did one national team visit and also spoke to some former managers as well. So um, I spent a lot of time out and about when I could with COVID, mm. um, speaking to the people that I felt would would help me. And on a personal level, Eddie, what did you learn during this period about yourself as as a partner and a parent? Well, one of my sections on there was my family. And naturally, when you've been in work like I had been and committed to my work. I mean, the commitment it takes, not just from a physical perspective, as in not being at home, but even when you are home, as you both know, that that mental, someone's talking to you, but you're not taking in, or you're thinking and planning of something else while someone's asking you a valid question at home, or you, you're not really there a lot of the time. And I felt I wasn't. So I was like, right, I'm going to use this time to really be at home. Yeah. And one of the first things I did, and you'll think this is probably a bit of a crisis moment, I brought a camper van. So I thought, right, I'm <laughs> going to take this camper van, sorry, around the country with my kids and I'm really going to give them the time. And we did, and we went on a few trips and it was it was really, really good. And I think it's something I look back on with huge um, fondness, really. Yeah. So I remember some wet weekends in uh, different places, but but brilliant for me at that time and, and hopefully brilliant memories for my kids as well. And what did you notice about your relationship with the kids? Well, I was able to do things that I'd never done. So taking the boys to school, picking them up right, and little things like that that you think, it's just amazing. I loved mm. it. And obviously it did wear off. Yeah, sure. But I, lo I loved it. I loved being being that dad. Um, I took them to, to cricket matches. I stayed away from football. But, I, I, you know, um, yeah, so I, I really invested in their lives. I was there for parents' evenings and stuff, things that I'd never been. But I think that the big thing is where I got my coaching fix, and this is quite interesting, my the only coaching I did in my time out from beginning to end was with my boys in the garden. So I was actually getting a little fix, <laughs> developing them and thinking of drills, you know, with, uh, with three boys in the garden. And how did they respond to their dad doing that? Terribly. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> was, was there any element? Cause you know, when we spoke, you said you were quite strict about this being a year out of the game. Um, and I think some job interviews or some job opportunities came your way in that year. Why would you not have been tempted after seven or eight months to say, you know what, I've had seven or eight months of this. I know I said it would be a year, but I'm going to go early, go back in early. Why, why did you turn down big jobs to fulfill an entire 12 months? Because uh, I, 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 again, it wasn't, well it, well, it was a conscious decision. I'm going to have a year. And I, I told everyone that needed to know it mm. was going to be a year and I wasn't going to break that for anything. Um, was it important uh, to tell people because, so they could hold you to well, it? Well, it was. If you've got an agent going around going, go for this interview, go for that interview. And I'm saying, no, I'm, yeah, he needed to mm. know. Now, he was still trying. but <laughs> Of course. He wants to get paid, right? Of course. But I was adamant. And I think I just, I knew I needed it. But the biggest mistake I could have made, I believe, is going straight back into another job. That would have been a disaster. Why? For me. Not just for me, but for the club. Because I wasn't, I, I knew I had to leave um, at the end of that season because I think there was two week break because of COVID so two weeks the lads were back in for pre-season training and I wasn't there mentally I would not have been the manager that Bournemouth needed me to be but if that was the case for Bournemouth that was the case for anyone else so I just needed to get away um, So rest. remind me regarding Bournemouth did yes. you did you quit that job or was it a kind of a mutual decision? Yeah, it, was a, it was a mutual decision. We had had such a good relationship and such yeah. a, uh, an unbelievable time together. We sat down and, you know, I discussed my feelings and it was, it was mutual. And would you have stayed if you'd had stayed up? No, I think it was, I think it was time. Yeah. I think I, I knew that season that um, it had taken every ounce of energy out of me to, uh, to try and keep the team up. And yeah, I, I, I was sort of a moment in my head that I just knew. Hard decision that though, isn't it? When football's your life. 
yeah, it's a hard decision when football is your life, and also that club, the, you know, Bournemouth was my life. So yeah. it was. Um, but I always felt in my heart that I had to do what was right for Bournemouth, not for me, um, which uh, was absolutely true at the time. I, I was thinking of, of both sides of it, not just mine. So do you think, given your relationship and your history with Bournemouth, you carried maybe a heavier burden than maybe you felt at Burnley or even coming here to Newcastle? I think, uh, yeah, I understand the question. I think it's uh, my history with Bournemouth and, and my history, not just with the club, but with the town and, and everything. It, yeah, I'm not sure if burden is the right word, but it, definitely I, my time there was intertwined with, with everything. You know, my kids are in the academy, so I'm sort of leaving training after so probably a 12 hour day to go and then watch them in the academy and help the coaches in the academy. Yeah. And so you're not getting back to sort of nine o'clock at night and you're doing that near enough every day. So yeah. it was, yeah, I'm not sure burden's the right word, but it's almost like, yeah, it was all encompassing. But I suppose the reason I ask is that you're describing this this break almost as a grieving period and in many ways understanding the depth and the strength of that relationship, it makes it more understandable than than yeah. maybe at another club. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to overplay it, but that's, that's just how I felt at the time, yeah. you know, so... You can only sort of express how you felt and that, that that's how I felt at the time. And that's why probably I was as strong on the year because I needed that time to fully mm. come full circle and then be ready to go again. And how did you know when you were ready? Uh, probably the harder I worked uh, on everything that I've right. already discussed. So the harder I was, I was a couple of hours a day at the start. I'm just going to write this training session down to probably three, four hours a day to five, six to seven, eight. And then almost it was up doing that. And then that was all I was doing. So that was when I knew I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, and I'm doing this because I want to get back in. And when I get back in, I want to be, I want to be good. And were you doing this on your own or was anyone helping you process your thoughts and your feelings? And Well, that was difficult because my coaching team that are with me now in Newcastle were in jobs and, and working. So I was, I was sort of on my own now. That's not to say I didn't have support. I did have brilliant support from you know my wife and uh, my family around me but in terms of football people I was alone which I actually in hindsight I think that was a good thing because it just took me right away I had no one else to sort of you know to 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 whine to or moan to it was a case of no just get your head around it and go again and then an opportunity comes up and it is at Newcastle United can you explain to us the process of how how the job came to be. Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I'm just trying to think if there's anything before. No, so it ended up being a, a basically uh, interview by Zoom. So yeah. with the time that it was. So um, a lot of people on a on a Zoom call. And yeah, that's sort of your, your time to show why you want the job, why, you're why you think you're capable of getting the job, what you will do with the team, your vision. And they said, you know, Zoom's a very difficult platform, I think, to do that because you're, you can't give off your personality mm. as well as you can if, when you're with people. So um, I just tried to be very honest. I tried to be very true to what, how I work and, and what I would do with the team um, and my philosophies around everything. That uh, I didn't present anything digitally. It was all through word of mouth. And yeah, then you wait and see what, what they think. But um, what was the what was the one message about you and what you were going to bring to the job and how how you had grown in that period out of the game? Because, you know, football judges people that aren't working, right? Why have you had a year out? It's seen as a negative, not a positive. So what message did you give the management here at that point? It's very much viewed as a, as a negative. I think yeah. that that time away is almost, oh, why has he been away? Yeah. You know, no, it's almost a view that no one wants you um you know which wasn't uh, wasn't the case and i think sometimes as i say respecting that that time that people have i think it's actually a strength not a weakness but anyway um my 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 unique selling point if you want to call it that what i think i do best is, is coach and develop players so i was very strong that if i'm able to to manage the team and the club then i will continue to coach and develop players that will never go from my dna that's something I believe so passionately uh, about and I think I'm good at it. So uh, that was my main push. And then, of course, around that is the style of football and 
how how I see the team playing mm. and what style of football I want to bring to Newcastle. And that's fundamental to the to the board and to the supporters. What they're going to see, what the, what product they're going to watch. So um, what, so what of sort of questions do they ask you? Then? I'm intrigued by this. That when you're applying for a job as a as a head coach here, what kind of questions are they throwing at you? Well, they want to know. Of course, they want to know about you, the person. They want they yeah. want to have an understanding of your your nature and um, you know because they're going to have to deal with you on a a very um, strong level in loads of different things, transfers and uh, staff. Are you going to fit? You know the the city, are the supporters going to take to you? There's there's so many things that they need to know about you. Right. And they need to know if you're strong enough, big enough, able enough to, to come in and, and fulfill that role. So it's, a, it's, you know, and this is why the, from the times that I went away and spoke to people, you know, those impressions, those first impressions that you give off and, and what you say is so important, but I find there's no scripts you can ever write. Yeah. You, 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 it has to come sort of off the cuff really it has to come from you and come from your heart if you're sat there reading something you've prepared i think you're, you're going to fail so it's got to it's got to be natural to you so i just spoke about as i say everything that i really really believe in strongly so i'm intrigued then in terms of when you're presenting so you're going back on your track record of success at bournemouth and that seems to me like you can tell a story of how you took over a team at a low ebb and how you developed and you coach players to get right the way through to the Premier League. But there was almost no expectation on you. Whereas here they're interviewing you for a job where you're coming in with new owners, there's a huge fan base, there's a huge level of expectation. How did you answer those concerns that they would have had to make them feel confident to hand you the reins? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's why you're the best, Damien, with questions well, like that. Um, can, I we, think... can, can you just repeat that? <laughs> because you get... I, I think, uh, you know, you, you obviously don't know my personality that well from behind the scenes, but I put so much pressure on myself, you know, that no one out on the outside can put more pressure on me. So what I mean by that is at Bournemouth, I had such high expectations of me and the team. And I felt we could really... Even when we got to the Premier League, everyone was like, well, in the Premier League, now, you, now you're going to come get straight relegated first year. It's, Bournemouth can't survive in the Premier League. And I was like, no, no, we, we, we're surviving the Premier League and we do well in the Premier League. So it, that expectation, although everyone maybe had, you know, Bournemouth's expectations here, mine were here, and that, that never changed. So then when you, yes, you, from the outside, you're perceived to get more expectations, but it, really all that matters is what you see yeah. and you, what your team around you see. And I still see that same elevated um, viewpoint that I've always seen. And I remember at the time we were on air, I think the day before you, you what was the game where you came and you sat in the away end um, before you got the job, before it was announced, but everyone thought you oh, were going to, it, it was a Brighton yeah. game, yep, you turn up. But, but until that point, Una Emery was the man who was being linked with this job, wasn't he? How do you deal with that when you know that a football club are also speaking to someone else and might have even had a, a first choice, if you like, who, who didn't take the job. How quickly do you and how do you process that and move on? Because I, I, I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast, that's what they struggle with, the, the comparison with other people or, you know, where do I sit in a pecking order in the business or in life? Don't worry about it. Mm. You know, it was very, can I control it? No, I can't control if they choose someone else. Um, so if I can't control it, don't waste energy on it. Um, I understood if there was someone else that they wanted ahead of me and someone with Unai's track record and managed in Europe, et cetera, the job that he's done at other clubs, I was like, do you know what? I'd probably make the right, the same decision if I was them. So I had no, no issues with it at all. Um, and then they came back and yeah, the rest is history. So I'm, I'm not never, look, I do believe in fate to a degree. Yeah. I do believe that think some things are meant to be. And if it, it was meant to be, it was, you know, it was going to happen. And what's that moment like when, the answer is yes. How quickly does your brain start saying to you, blimey, I hope you can carry this job. This is big. The stadium's big. The expectation's big. The, you know, these fans have been through the mill the last few years. How 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 quickly did that appear, if at all? And how did you deal with it? Uh, straight away. Straight really? away. Yeah, there's no there's no uh, no real celebration or honeymoon period in my head. It's almost like, right, what are we going to do? Straight away. What are we going to do? How are we going to keep this team in the Premier League? Um. And then all the work you've done previously, going back to that, all the preparation I've done, 
was for that moment. Right, I know what I'm going to do because it's it's all planned, it's all prepared. So what was the first thing you did? Well, the first thing you've got to do is get the players with you um, and on side because they're the ones that ultimately are, are going to do the business for you. So it was a case of I was very lucky that I had three players that I'd worked with previously. So Callum Wilson, Matt Ritchie and Ryan Fraser. Um, so that they were relationships that were really important in the early stages because we right. could speak with them and they could obviously speak to the other players and it give them an understanding of what was to come, like how we work, what we want. And, and what what would you want quickly. those players to say to the rest of the squad? Hopefully, about good you? things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not even just like not even just like oh, he's a good guy, but almost you almost want them to set the level of expectation, don't you? In terms of this is how hard you need to work. This is how yeah. you need to be around the place. What 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 would you have wanted them to say? Well, I would want them to to say the truth, uh, what their truth is. So I'd love them to have said things that I. I believe, but really it's what how they perceive me. So yep. if they perceive me as, you know, training's gonna be hard, training's gonna be intense, training's gonna be detailed, training's gonna be all um, towards our, our next game. We're gonna have a clear philosophy. There'll be no hiding places. It'll, it'll be physically demanding. You gotta prepare for training. You can't just stroll up and, and be indisciplined and, and, and not have slept well the night before. So I would have wanted all those messages to go out, but I can't force that. That's yeah. got to come from them. But I, I, I'd i imagine they would have been some of the things, maybe with a couple of negatives in there as well. Like what? Well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm intense. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm focused for the players' careers. I, I really want the, the players' careers to excel, but that can sometimes be seen as um, too demanding or okay. too intense or, you know, there's there's always that meet you know that balance you've got to get right. Um, but my my main, I think, attribute is I'm for the players to do well. So when you walk into the dressing room on that first day, then at training, you know, inevitably you're coming in after, in the aftermath of a manager that's been dismissed. So things might be flat or not working or maybe a bit dysfunctional. What do you do to lift the mood? before you then start to get the chance to bring that intensity and the kind of more thoughtful approach to training that you're describing? Yeah, without without remembering every uh, detail of what I did, but it's about setting your vision. And I think we had a clear vision. Our vision was to stay in the league. Right. Um, so vision drives decision. So uh, as we know, so we we had a clear vision. Our, our, our plan was, was there, right? We have to get enough points to stay in the division. Um, and but how are we going to do that? And then that comes back to our daily work, our our practices, our habits, our culture. What about the self belief element? It was a, a a team used to losing. So how did you go about addressing their self belief? I think self belief, uh, I think, just comes from your work, your daily work, your training. Um, so I think the culture is is absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. So what you want to see from your players' behaviour around the training ground. Um, day to day in the morning. And I think you have to set a few things in place to hopefully improve that, which we, we which we did. But then the belief quickly comes, I think if the training's pitched right, uh, players enjoy it, but they find it demanding. Mm. The players enjoy it, but know that it's, they're gonna improve their team's performance on a match day. And then I think if you've got good players within the group, which we do, I think then the quickly things can snowball from there. So. I'm interested in when you said that review of your own period outside of the game that you found it a little bit more difficult to focus on what you did well. Your instinct was to look at what could I improve, what could I do better. To drive confidence and that self-belief that Jake's talking about, you need to almost catch people doing things right rather than catch them doing it wrong. So how do you overcome that inherent bias in yourself not to focus on the good stuff? What kind of tips or techniques do you get to catch people doing these things well to build confidence i think i'm uh, two two things i think with myself i'm more naturally hard on myself right i've always been that way but i think that's people can view that as a weakness but i think it's a strength i'm always looking to improve me rather than going on i great yeah so i think that's a strength but with other people say with my players i'd always look at right you do this great but i think you can improve this so I'm sort of the other way around with other people. Okay. Um, I think you have to, players have to believe that you love them. Players are only going to play for you uh, to the, their best levels if you have that trust between you. The manager loves me. 
manager loves the qualities that I can bring, but he does want me to improve these couple of areas of my game to make me even better. And that, that's very much how I view my players. So tell us about that small word you use there, trust, because that fascinates me in so many ways because lots of people talk about a manager needs to trust of a dressing room. How do you interpret trust and how do you build it and develop it? Well, I think trust is a two-way thing. I, I don't think it's the manager can purely trust his players and I think that there, there has to be a two-way thing. I think ultimately as the as the manager, I think you have to set that. Um, you have to set your your boundaries with the players. Yeah, they have to, you have to be very clear of what you expect. There can be no gray areas in terms of behavior, in terms of expectations on the training ground. And I think once you set those boundaries, the players will either fall into it or they'll fall out of it. And yeah. if they fall out of it, then the trust is broken. If they fall into it, then um, I think you'll have a great relationship. Yeah, no. And how many chances do players get with you to get it right? I think there's, I think it depends on what it is. Yeah. Uh, in, in a sense of what, they may have done wrong. I, you know, I, I do believe in, in second chances. I do believe in helping and educating players and, and trying to guide them because you got to look at them as your son. I try and treat them as my sons, really, rather than as players. I, you know, what would I do if this was my son sat in front of me now? How would I treat him? Would I give him a second chance? Yes, I would. And I try and educate him, help him as to why he's done wrong or why I think he needs help in that area of his life. Uh, yeah, I that's the view I try and take. Now, if a player is making a conscious decision to go against what you're trying to do, I think that's a totally different thing. Yeah. And that's where a line might have to be drawn. Have you had to deal with that? I think in my career, yeah. Thousands, yeah. Say thousands of times, a lot of times, yeah, because it's human nature. I think you're always going to get conflict in a team of 25 players when you can only pick 11. And then obviously then you have substitutes on that. There's going to be moments of conflict and confrontation. Um, so, yeah. And that old Alex Ferguson quote of don't go looking for it, it'll come and find you, comes to mind there. So I'm interested for anyone listening to this that they might see confrontation in their life or something that needs to be addressed quickly. What hints and tips would you give about doing that effectively to be able to address the issue and then move on? I would say as I've got older, I've definitely taken more of a leaf out of Sir Alex's book where I haven't seeked it. And I do believe that players will will always show you if they want to be with you or not. You don't have to push. I think probably when I was younger, uh, in my early stages of my man management career, I would go looking for conflict and confrontation. Um, not, not necessarily to, to prove anything, but I, I, I almost wanted to find the solution straight away. Yeah. But sometimes you can actually gain more from stepping back um, and allowing things to work out okay or then having to yeah. uh, deal with the the problem that is in front of you i think that's the better approach but i think ultimately nothing beats a, a very honest conversation nothing beats the truth so you've disappointed me and this is why so you either change or you you come on board brilliant what did you find when you arrived at newcastle then because we all have opinions we've spoken about you know this podcast is about empathy not opinion what did you find here that gave you an idea as to why things were a struggle? So I, I prefer to look at it the other way in terms of when I arrived, what did I find that was positive? Because genuinely, that's what I did. Yeah. Did you? So you turned up and you yeah, I wanted made to a conscious effort not to focus on the negative yeah. stuff? Yeah. That's interesting, though, because with yourself, you spent a year focusing on your on your negatives and your problems, yet you turn up here and you think, right, let's Let's so that, focus on the positive. But that's why I say I, I sort of have two different views on it with other people and with my team. I'll be yeah. very much positive first. With myself, I'll very much be the other way. Why? I don't know, but that's just how I'm built. So when I arrived, I wanted to focus on the positive. The last thing I wanted to do is come here and go anything negative. Yeah. So what did you find then? So I found a really, really hardworking group of players, a group of players that wanted to do really, really well, a group of players that wanted to be coached, which surprise me um talented um keen. why did it surprise you that they wanted to be coached well because i think coaching is um coaching is a it's a de it's a delicate one with mm. obviously with experienced players and there, there was a lot of experienced players in the squad so a lot of players sort of mid-20s early 30s um and you, you almost go one or two ways with that is be left alone and just play or yeah, how can you make me better? And mm. I was 
so so pleased that it was the latter it was like how can you make me better what can you do for me in my career I'm, I'm sort of an open book and a lot of the players were like that and that that gave us a great start point to then bring our work bring our method and try and improve the team um and i saw a lot of talented players so for me and and some good lads you know yeah. players that wanted to do well there was no problems with discipline um nothing that we couldn't put right with a few s simple rules and uh yeah away we went and then the team slowly improved and did you do did you do one-on-ones with everyone or was it a group thing i did one-on-ones with everyone to start with i think that's imp really important because yes i knew three of the players but i didn't know anyone mm. else so it was a case of get to know the players get to know the the family uh, behind the player um i want to know i wanted to know everything about them um a little bit about their history as to how they've ended up here and then how i could help them and and where they saw their career because i think you sort of need to get to know a little bit of the history before you can then help them yeah. refix their goals. And is it true, Eddie, I heard this story about you, so you can either confirm or deny it, that one of the things that you did was find out some of the detail about partners' names, birthdays, things like that, so you could just add to that personal touch of reminding them that oh, it's your partner's birthday today, happy birthday, and was that part of that one-on-one -on -one period? Yeah, it's something that, you know, I think you... you can see the player train, you can see the player on match day, but then behind it, if you don't know too, if you don't know anything about them yeah. and you're having a conversation with them, you don't know if, whether they have children or not. I, I don't think that's a conversation that's going to last long. Yeah. And I think the player will very quickly think you're not really interested in me. Yeah. You're just talking to me because you, you feel you need to. So I really, I didn't want those types of conversations. I really want to know, because if I'm going to invest my time and energy to try and make you better yeah, um, and really commit, you know, late at night thinking about training sessions for you i want to know more about the person i'm doing that for yeah so it's, i think it's a vital part of the job and that that's how sort of close i want to get to my players really yeah and what does that do for you then because obviously your job's to win football matches right and it, it i think it's quite rare to hear someone talk about the fact that a player's career is the thing that you almost care about the most is it because if you think about their career you're thinking about them and if you're thinking about them then they're improving and if they're improving it's it's good for everyone yeah i think it's that step by step approach i think i yeah, obviously i'm in charge of the team and i want the team to do really really well yeah but i think the best way for the team to do really really well is for the individual to excel and if i could, can try and improve those 25 players each individually mm -hmm. and really invest in them then i think the the team and the club will never look back so yes, it's a, it's a sort of a step-by-step -step approach and it's how I've always been. Now, whether that's because my playing career was frustratingly average, um, whether that's sort of formed me as a, as a manager and as a coach, I don't know, um, possibly, because I, you know, I wanted to achieve great things in my playing career and I never quite got there through different reasons. Um, so whether there's a bit in there that, that formed me, I think possibly. So some of your playing career, and like I know your playing career was cut short through injury, but when you look back on that period, do you, how would you have liked to have been coached by you? Oh, that's a good question. Would I have liked me? I don't know. I think I would have done. I think I would have done. I think I would have liked that personal touch. I would like that one-to-one -one coaching because you think you've got 22 players running around on a football pitch. Um, it's very easy to just look at the team and forget the individual within the team. But everyone's at different stages of their career. Everyone is different things. Uh, so I, I think I'd have loved the, the care and attention um, and the, then the self-improvement to uh, to follow that up. Well, on those early one-to-one -one sessions, what was the, the most valuable question that you asked the players? The one that taught you the most about what you were about to step into? I don't think there was anything from a football level. I think it was more their, their background. So whether yeah. it's brothers, sisters, uh, children, mum or dad i think they're the conversations that you you learn the most about the person and yeah. their motivations and why they're here there's always you know a story whether it's the yeah, i had three brothers and we were in the garden all day and that's how i became a footballer and i was the youngest uh or i was a lonely child you know wh whatever their story is i think it's fascinating to hear it and i'm sort of now asking that question then thinking of my own kids and because when you become a father i think that's a, a massive that was a massive change for me in my life. And I think I'd love to think I've become a better manager since becoming a dad as well. And you will have players here with challenging upbringings. 
challenging backgrounds. You know, we talk often that something that's not your fault is still your responsibility. There'll be a lot of players here that carry baggage that isn't their fault, but actually it's there and your responsibility to, to help them with that. So do you manage the players differently depending on what you learn about their background? Definitely. I think you have to. I can't treat all 25 players the same. Yeah. Because as you said, they've all had different backgrounds. They come from different countries. Their, their, their experiences in life and in sport are so different. And their personalities are different. That's obvious. So then you have to treat one person differently to the next to get the best out of them, but also to for them to feel safe in the environment that you're trying to create. And I think having that understanding, as I said, have, being a dad myself has then helped me so much with that. Because I think without that experience, I think their job becomes uh, much more of a challenge. You have the empathy and the understanding of what it's like to be a dad, what it's like to be a son. Um, and that can only help you, mm. I think, in your dealing with the players. And do you get the players to share their stories with each other as well? And the reason I, that I'm asking this is when we interviewed Sia Khaleesi, the South African rugby captain, he said that those exercises of sharing their own stories with each other were like a catalyst to build deeper relationships, stronger bonds that he felt was the springboard for them to go on and win the World Cup. Yeah, we do. So <clears throat> as part of our, our fine system, we have a sort of a weekly meeting or one, once every two weeks now um, where one player from the squad will then tell his story. Um, now, one of the first things I did was tell mine to the, to the group. So first coming in, I thought, well, if I'm going to set this as part of what we do I've got to lead from the front and do it myself and I actually found it uh, quite emotional to do that so you go back and you, you you tell things that you think are relevant and what people need to know about you and we've had some brilliant stories some brilliant um, uh, talks by the players and you find out so much stuff that yeah. even from a conversation between me and you now I could never you could never tell me stuff but then in that format it's almost the players want to tell their story and they're telling things that are very personal to them. But I do believe it brings you closer together and also it gives you an understanding if someone's having a bad day, there might be a reason why he's having a bad day and uh, to, you know, to ask the right questions. And what's the atmosphere like in the room when that's happening? Yeah, you could hear a pin drop. It's, it's everyone's very respectful and understanding that it's going to be their turn at some stage. So give the person all the support that, that they can. And uh, now we've had some really good ones. Because I look, because I often wonder, you know, when you look from the outside in, where you see football teams do like um, initiation ceremonies, and somebody's got to stand up and sing a song, and the rest of the squad throw red rolls at them and things like <laughs> that. And I often wonder, like, how useful they are, because I'm not sure what the effect of it is, but I can certainly see the effect of somebody standing up and sharing something deeply personal and being heard and recognised, rather than like made fun of or something like that. Like where do you stand on that kind of initiation ceremony versus what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think depends what you're looking for. I think the initiation ceremonies have a, have a place if you want to have a laugh and you yeah. want to get the lads together laughing, joking at each other and not taking themselves too seriously. I can sort of see the merits in that yeah. um, as long as you know what it is. Um, but th this one is... I think a lot of respect. If you're willing to talk about something that's personal to you, then you have to give that person a lot of respect. And then you have to give them the, you know, the vehicle to then express themselves with no judgments. And um, no, it's, it's worked really well. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm massively for the initiation ceremony unless it's, you know, we've done it during pre-season to get a new group bonded together yeah. and try and create some laughter because laughter is ultimately so, so powerful. So you've got another challenge now, which is new players coming into the group. What What is your message to the new players that Newcastle sign? How do you let them know very quickly the expectations of you and, and of this football club? What's your go-to? Yeah, it's a good question. My go-to would be, you know, we've got several presentations on how we train, why we train as we do. Um, I always do a presentation very early on why we've signed the player as well. So we've signed you because... We love this about you. We love we love the fact all positive stuff. Yeah, it's all positive stuff. Yeah, the the, the development stuff that can wait till after. Yeah. But I think the first impression is we have signed you because we love you as a player, and this is why. Uh, again, it goes back to the strengths thing. I think you have to people have to know mm. why you're bringing them to the football club, and then you set your expectations with a series of small little meetings about what we do and why we do it. So, 
when I think of someone like Kieran Trippier that you that you signed, it appeared again from the outside that you were recruiting him not only for his talent as a footballer, but for his characteristics as a person and more importantly as a leader in that dressing room of coming in with high standards, you've experienced winning La Liga, for example. How much do you actually give them that explicit brief of leadership versus just allow it to happen organically? Yeah, well, I think at the time when we signed Kieran in, in January, we were trying to sign leaders. Right. So relegation battle, very, very difficult situation we were in. We felt we couldn't sign players for the future. It was for the here and now. And it was try and generate a team spirit in the group that will be so strong that that will carry us over the line. So Kieran, you know, I had worked with him at Burnley. I knew... Um, about him and his background and the fact he'd gone on to have a brilliant career is down to his leadership and his attitude. So him, Dan Byrne, um, Chris Wood, all experienced players, um, but had that leadership quality in them. And I've got to say, they did a brilliant job in the dressing room and, and just in terms of, it was already good, but the feeling, but just gluing it together and making it stronger. But when we interviewed Phil Neville, for example, he said when he went from Manchester United to Everton, that, he was happy just to go into the dressing room and establish his credentials like bit by bit over time. And yet he said he found when David Moyes gave him the captaincy, that put him under a lot of pressure. The dynamic in the dressing room shifted. So how explicit were you with the rest of the group that these guys are going to come in and set the standards versus almost just let them get on with it? Yeah, no, I don't I don't think that's a dangerous thing to do is to always build them up. Yeah. Say they're going to come in and do that. I think, no, I think... Just let them do, let them lead. Because it really, there's, there's loads of different ways to lead. But the most powerful one, I think, in a, in a football sense is leading by example on the training pitch. Right. Um, and those guys did that immediately. Their standards were very high. Now then, if you can be vocal with that and demanding with that in time, because I don't think you're going to do that from day one, but vocal and demanding with that as you get comfortable in the group, then, you know, that's that's like gold dust for the for the team. And, and despite the period of self-reflection for a year and then choosing a job that felt right and selling yourself and then meeting the players and doing all the, the right things, was there a moment before the end of the season where you had the fear that relegation was going to come to this football club and you were going to be part of that? Yeah, I think it was always there. Yeah. I, you know, I, there was no escaping it, especially when we first went in, we had some, you know, the results didn't come immediately. Mm. So it was... Did that surprise you? Um... No, it didn't surprise me because I knew yeah. how difficult the Premier League is and nothing surprises me in, in the, the with how hard this league is. So, and things can happen like against Norwich. We had a man sent off very early in the game, as you'll know, against Norwich and we ended up drawing the game and I was really proud of the, the effort. But that was a game that was sort of built up internally and externally that we had to win to stay up. So we had some early knocks. Um, but then just momentum and the win against Leeds was absolutely key for us. We then had a two week break and then the, yeah, just, you could feel the group believed. Let's talk about a couple of bits there. then the first one is the Norwich draw. When the whole world said, if Newcastle don't win this, that's them done. What did you say to the players after that? I was really, really pleased. Really, we you know we played with 10 men for a long, long time in the game. I think we took the lead and uh, Norwich equalized quite late on. But the effort that the players left yeah. on that pitch. But did you address the the fear they would have then had? Like everyone said we had to win this and we didn't. No, because I think I, for me, as long as I see a team give everything on the pitch, the result you can never guarantee. But you, yeah. what you need to do is get the, I always say to the to the lads here that if the supporters clap you off, that that's, that's good enough. Because if they're clapping you off, they've seen you've given everything. The, the supporters here won't take or tolerate anything less. So if they're clapping against Norwich to a man, the supporters stood up and went, no, I've seen the players give everything. And I knew if we could consistently do that, we'd be fine. Now, don't get me wrong, there comes a time where you need the results to match that. But I, I felt really, really pleased after that, although we obviously didn't get the points we needed. And then after the international break, when you felt a, you felt a momentum shift, yeah? Well, yeah, we won the game going into the international break and then we, we took the lads away and it was just a really good feeling that you think, now we, we can do this, even though we were still a long way behind. Um, you can, Sometimes you can sense how a team is gelling together and, and how the, the players are interacting with each other 
And I, I, yeah, I just felt we were in a good place. And how did you then keep the keep that going without bursting the bubble, either at training or before or after games? What did you do in that in that period where you felt like, okay, this is this is actually happening? Well, I think we had we had we set goals, so yeah. we, we had a clear structure of these are the points we need from these games. Now we were down, as I say early on, we were down on points, so you've got to try and you don't want to fall too far off it because it can become a negative. But thankfully, we were we were a bit down, but we were not too far away, so I could keep that very strong and say, right now, okay, we're just going to add the points that we need onto the next group of games, um, and there was enough leeway for it not to be a negative, as I say. Which they can be if it's too if it's unrealistic, and I think we ended up finishing the season way above our points mm. target. So I definitely think that helped. It just helped keep the lads on track after a bad result. And I'd like to talk about you know your personal experience then of being the Newcastle manager. You know we're here at the stadium; it's massive. The city, as you've already said, everywhere you uh, everywhere you are in the city, you see this stadium. How does that sit with any imposter syndrome that you have floating around? I don't know. The first day you walk out at St. James's Park and everyone hears Eddie Howe, the saviour, going to keep us up. Well, actually, the first day I didn't because I, I got COVID. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> couldn't I believe totally it. I forgot about that. Yeah, couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, my God. So, so, you, yeah. so when did you realise that you, when did you test positive and realise that you couldn't be here for the, for the first game? The day before. On a Friday, yeah. So any other time and... You know, it would have been fine, but just that day meant that that obviously I had to miss out. So I was in the hotel, hearing a delayed noise from the crowd where there was a goal. We drew three, also as a load of goals, uh, and that was a that was a tough experience. Um, no, but you know, I, I haven't really felt that imposter syndrome, um, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I've just I felt very comfortable here. I felt um, welcomed by everybody, welcomed by the staff, welcomed by the supporters, welcomed by the players. And um, I've really, really enjoyed what is a very difficult job, a mm. uh, high pressure job, but I've enjoyed that to this point and I'm very thankful for, for everyone for that. And how, how do you square away that at Bournemouth, you know, you had earned a lot of credit in the bank at that football club, whereas here you're at one of the richest clubs in the world. You know, the, I think we'd all agree the reality is six bad results and maybe less and the question marks come and maybe even the job goes. How do you not let that overwhelm you? Yeah, good question. I think by not overanalyzing and thinking too deeply, um, because I don't think that's healthy. And I've, again, I think I've learned that through the years to, to focus on what you can control. So I can mm. control the training. I can control the players to a degree. Um, I could control all the things around the team performance in the, in the way that I can. You know, if I focus on that and make sure that's as good as it can be while doing loads of other, obviously different things, motivation and um, treating people in the right way. Yeah, that, that's all you can do. But the minute you start thinking, what if negative things happen, yeah. you'll, you'll project fear. And projecting fear to players is a very dangerous thing. You, they've got to enter that pitch, believing in everything you've delivered. So linked to that then, talking about the kind of narrative of coming here to Newcastle, that inevitably, since the, it was taken over by the by the Saudi fund, you've had questions come your way about the brand washing and Saudi ownership of football clubs that are coming direct to you as the figurehead of the club. How do you deal with that? Well, I just have to speak, you know, my my truth and and from my perspective. So I came here for the football club to to coach the team, to manage the team, to coach the players, give the best of my ability from a footballing perspective. And yes, there's some difficult questions to answer, but everything I've done is um, is based around football. And how important is it for you to educate yourself about those matters off the pitch? Yeah, massive. It was a huge thing. And I said that very early in my tenure here, that that was um, a big part of what I needed to do. Now I'm still, I don't think that ever ends. I think you're always educating yourself on certain things that are arising around the world. Um, but I'm very, very proud to to manage this football club and I hope to do so for, for a long time. It's never a pressure-free job. Um, one thing that struck me, and I wasn't offended by this, by the way, but when we spoke on the phone, you were listening to the podcast religiously. When I saw you at Norwich and I went, what's your, <laughs> what's your latest episode of High Performance? You went, oh, I've stopped listening now. Now, I don't mind, right? You do I, a bit. I'm seriously pissed off. No, but the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, is that you were in a really, like you were in a growth space, right, in that year out. 
Is there a way that you can be in a growth space, but also in a pressure space here? Or are you too committed and too all in? And I suppose really what I'm trying to say is, are you able to do this job and enjoy doing this job? I, I, in a weird way, I do enjoy it, but it, it's not in a, you don't necessarily feel that enjoyment every minute. It's sort of sometimes reflective enjoyment comes uh, two weeks after something's happened. Go, oh, I really enjoyed that two weeks ago. But at the time you sort of, you don't necessarily yeah. feel that. Um, the reason I haven't listened to the podcast is not because I don't love it anymore and I do. And there, there is definite learning to take from the various guests. I hope someone finds something interesting from this. Um, but it's, you just have to prioritize what you're doing. So yeah. I'm prioritizing loads of different things. And then you, you find your time in the day is just gone. And then you're, you're doing that obviously every day yeah. and you just, you have to prioritize. So uh, I'm, I apologize for that. But I'm, inter I'm, I'm interested in what you said about that 12 year period at Bournemouth where you almost didn't get a chance to develop yourself because it was so frenetic. How were, how were you going to give yourself some space and time to still develop yourself while, while going back into the fray of management? When I said I didn't develop myself, that, that was yeah not entirely accurate. I, I probably would say I did more for my development probably than most managers are able to do, but just because I would sort of push myself every sort of break, right. I would, I'd be here, there and everywhere trying to seek more growth and learning. Um, but it's obviously more difficult in work. Yeah. And I'd say it's more difficult the higher profile club you're at because more doors are shut on you than if you're in sure. the lower leagues. So uh, that's something I just have to deal with and um, yeah, uh, somehow keep keep on top of things. But I do feel I've learned from a new staff, like in coming into a new staff, Graham Jones has uh, come into my staff now and I've loved working with him and that having that new idea and that new brain has been really beneficial for me as had the other staff that I've inherited. And can I ask you a question no, like, like personally about, the, I didn't get a chance to ask when we were talking about taking on this job. When do you start the conversations with your wife and your children? That So you're in the interview process, but when do you start to almost sow the seed with them that we might be leaving our base here and going somewhere else? When, like, How does that process happen? Yeah, that's, a, again, another good question. I mean, quite loosely, because there's no guarantee of anything. So you yeah. might say, oh, I'm just having a chat with this club. And there's sort of an understanding that that's happening. Um but with no guarantees or promises and literally then click of the fingers, right. I'm off. <laughs> it's literally like that. Cause there's no other, you know, I'm going and yeah. uh, obviously we have discussion that I want to get back in and we might have to move. And you obviously come to a shared agreement that, sure. that you, we, you know, I'd be supported in that, but the actual moment that it comes is very quick and sudden. And then suddenly I'm the other side of the country and making plans then for them to join me. And once your family are up here with you now, how is how hard do you find the switching on and off when you're at work or at home? I think I've got better at it, but yeah, it's difficult. Mm. Um, I think I, I love to be there for my for my boys. Uh, I love to be present when they're when they need you. Uh, usually in the garden with a football, uh, which means you can never escape the game. But that you know you would never any other way. But uh, yeah, I try to be there, and I try to be there with my wife. And I think I've got better at that. I love to think I've got better at that as I've got older. Yeah. Um, but it's still a challenge for me because I am ultimately very committed to my work. And, and in a job like this, I can imagine that the ability to delegate is even more demanding or more even, even more important than it would have been at Bournemouth where maybe you had a, a grasp on more aspects. What have you learned about the art of delegation that listeners could take on? Well, yeah, I'd say the art of delegation is massive. And I'd say historically for me, that's been a big weakness. Um, definitely in my early days, it was it was well, just me and Jason, to be honest, Jason Tindall, um, and we did everything. And sort of once you get accustomed to that, that's the normal way of working. So it's two people doing everything. Um, you got to remember we, we had nothing, you know, the, yeah. the resources we had at Bournemouth in our early days formed us, but we had nothing. So we were taking on all sorts of different things, scouting, you know, whatever there is sports science we were doing a lot so that's been really good for us but then then the job changes you get more staff and you get end up at a much bigger um bigger resources but you're still acting like there's just two of you so that's yeah. been a weakness of mine because of that that process really so it's something that I'm, I'm learning to do better as i get older again i think um it's something i need to do 
even more of. I need to give more trust and accountability to other people. But I've sort of become, yeah, very hands-on and I'm reluctant to lose that hands-on approach. There's certain things that I can't hide from here. So media duties and all the other things you have to do, which means then, you you know, your time's pulled. So you, you need to give. What part of the job sits least comfortably with you? I think anything that's not um, with my players is is not viewed as a negative by me but for me the the main attraction to the job is the grass mm. the balls the coaching the players the improvement the analyzing preparing and then doing you know that whole process i love anything around that is almost a bit of a distraction from that so it's making sure those distractions don't take you away from what i believe is the, the at the core of success really and what is the part of your job that is misunderstood the most the the element of management that we just should know and you'd love to share yeah with probably the effect that you can have i think i think it can be underestimated the effect you can have on the team on the individual players i think and that's why i'm so passionate about trying to have interaction with my players on a daily basis i don't like going through a day where i don't really feel i've spoke to them or impacted them whether that be on the training pitch mm -hmm. or off the training pitch because i think you have to be viewed as um, the players probably wouldn't like this, but as a as a mentor or a father figure or whatever whatever people want to bracket yeah. it, I think you've got to be important in their lives for them to play their best football. I don't like being a distant, unrelatable, not contactable, don't speak to him type figure. That's that's not how a, how I would manage or how I really think the job should be done. I think it's a collaboration rather than a dictatorial type process. So in the book's tokenomics, I think it was a guy called Stefan Szymanski and Simon Cooper estimated that a head coach impacts between 10 and 20% of a team's performance and then the rest of it is all other uh, extraneous stuff. What percentage do you think you can affect the team's performance? That is a tough one, Damien, but I'm going to say a, a little bit more than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you've given me a number. So I'll go 30. Uh, I, I really don't know, but... Um, I do believe, I do believe, and it's not just me, by the way, I'm, I'm not just saying I'm the only one that oh, can no. affect, I'm saying my coaching team, mm. sports science team, physio team, everyone connected with the club can have an impact on the players, kit men, you know, the people that are there having contact with the players, I think can help shape a mindset and a mood and a feeling that can, that can linger beyond the day. So I think we have to be very mindful of that when we're, when we're dealing with the players. And who coaches you? That is a good question. I think obviously my main pillar of support is my wife. Um, she's the one that on a bad result or a bad day will text me, will be there for me. And there's very few other people that are sort of yeah. there, you know, when it's, when it's really bad, you know, when you've had a really bad day. And I think you sort of know that again, as you get older, you, you, you sort of know the people that are there for you truly and the people that aren't. And, I think they're they're incredibly important. I'm always interested in this. What's the kind of hidden cost of of your job? I think it's the missed things, the the days you miss, the moments you miss that you don't get back. So, I miss both my kids' birthdays this year. I'll say both because my younger one had his in March, and I was so there for that. And I think I might have missed all of them. I think I've missed all. Yeah, no, I've missed all three this year. So they're opening presents, and you're, you've got a camera there, and you're looking at. Oh, that's really nice, but you. You've got other things. Yeah, you've got training to prepare that day, so you never get that moment back. You know, the sports days. I don't think I've seen a sports day. I don't think I've seen loads of other parents' evenings. I'm very rarely there, so that's why the timeout was really good for me because I was in all those things that I'd never been, and I was able to experience that with my kids. And I have to say, they're very, very good with me. They never sort of accuse me of, but you weren't here, or <laughs> they. I think they have an understanding that. Well, they're proud of their dad managing mm. Newcastle now and they sort of accept there's a little bit that they miss because of that uh, but they've been very good with me is there a question we should have asked you and that we haven't no I'm barely remembering what you are asking <laughs> me yeah like what you haven't so no I think you've been very good and what about on your notes so those notes that you made in your year out is there anything else you'd really like to share with the so audience I think there was there was one thing and it was a uh, it was more of a mindset for me really uh put down here to be grateful so what I, I remember reading the book Magic uh, by Rona Byrne, I think it is, and it's sort of similar lines to The Secret. And uh, I thought it was a brilliant book. 
And it just at that moment, this was about, I think, three months after I left Bournemouth, it was to be thankful for what I'd achieved there and thankful for the journey that we went on rather than looking at it just purely for the last part, to be thankful for everything yeah. that happened beforehand and just to be thankful for everything in my life. I consider myself very lucky, very fortunate. And um, yeah, I'm very grateful. And have you been able to adopt that here where you lose a game, the pressure's huge. I mean, the fan base here is incredible. Are you able to deal with those negative moments with that new mindset or is it all sound well and good when you're out of work, when you're back in work, you're not quite so kind to yourself? Yeah, I think there's, of course, you go back and you, you sort of have this vision, right? That's, and then it's, you, you go with the emotion and the feeling of the day. And, but I do think even doing things like this with you today has helped bring me back to where I was. Yeah. Are you kind enough to yourself? Uh, pro probably not, no. But it's got me to to this point. Uh, so something in that attitude that I have, where I'm constantly demanding myself to improve, I'm constantly on myself not to be lazy. I know, you know, I'm I'm sort of the opposite of lazy. Mm. I'm always doing, and but I like that about myself. So I, I probably wouldn't change. But it's I think it's just tweaking to try and enjoy things moments more would be the challenge I have. And how often do you slip? You know, you're demanding on yourself, you know, you want to achieve a lot in a day, but no one's flawless. Yeah, I'd say uh, it's more for my players. So it's, it, the, the thing will be in the morning when you're planning the day, it'd be like, I'm not happy with this. The players aren't getting enough development or are not getting enough from me or from you or from you. We need to give them more. Uh, do I slip from I don't really I don't feel I slip from that mm. mindset um, of course you'll have you're then what you'll deliver sometimes will be better than other days well, yeah. you know, that was, wasn't a great day today we need to analyse what, what, what went wrong there well, that was a really good day today well done so it's always for the players we're going to run through our quick fire questions um, and this is an interesting one with the players you've recruited with the staff that are working here with you know the people who are no longer on the on the journey with you the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you have to buy into? Quite basic, if I can remember them. If I can't, I'll have to go to my notes. Uh, and I have, uh, bear in mind, I presented this to my players. So off the back of your podcast, this was one of my first meetings I had with them. I, I recommended they listen to it. So I sat them down and said, high performance podcast, both okay. your faces at the front. And I said, listen to this podcast. It's amazing. Um, and I said, they got this section on their three non-negotiable beha non behaviours. And these are my three, so you understand me more. Always give your best. Very basic. Um, I can't remember the second Go one. Go on, get them up. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would happen. Um, oh yeah, be willing to learn and improve and put the interests of the team before your own personal interests. Did you ever ask for theirs? Well, Jacob Murphy, who listens to your podcast as well, um, he gave me his. Uh, don't ask me to remember them, but... Yes, they, a couple of them came back. Nice. Wow. What advice would you give to a teenage Eddie just starting out? Well, I'm going to contradict myself with my answer here. So I would say back off yourself a little bit and enjoy it a bit more. Go easy on yourself. But as we said earlier, that's enabled me to get to this position, which when you consider where I was at 16, I would never have believed it possible what I've done in my life. So... I'm not sure if that's the right advice, but almost along the way, just just try and take it in and enjoy it a bit more. But do you think you could have got to the same place if you'd have been a little bit kinder? No. Right. I, I honestly don't know. I've had to push and work and sacrifice to get here. And I don't think I could have done it another way. I, You know, I totally resonate with that because I spend my life watching people achieve great things thinking, I, I hope you don't enjoy the moment, you know, make the most of it. But I totally think, I don't know what you think from the people you've met and the research that's out there. Like if you spend your time really enjoying those moments, I do think it takes away from, you're not the kind of person that's driven to get to the next yeah. one. You know, it's like one or the other. Everything, everything has a, like a, yeah. a balance, right? There's a payoff for everything. Yeah. Fair no, point. I think, I think it's in, I don't think, think there's a right or wrong answer. Is it? I think that's the point. I don't think, so I just don't think there's loads of high achievers going around just going, you know, I'm just enjoying every minute of every day. And no, I don't get there by accident. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's high performance isn't an accident. I think you can explain it, but I don't think there's one set route to get there. No, but there is like an algorithm, I think, to success, you know, 
where you you realize the level of dedication the level of detail we call them world-class basics you know like the not hard difficult things to achieve easy things that everyone can do every day that takes everyone closer you know yeah but i think like if you think about like if you take two people that got to the same destination jo johnny wilkinson and dan carter in the interview johnny spoke about sacrifice and struggle to get to become the world's best rugby player dan carter spoke about the joy of just being with his mates and throwing the ball around and loving rugby mm. and having the gratitude that Eddie describes. So they both got to the same. Yeah, but Dan place. Carter breaks his day down into 10 second blocks and sure. sets himself a challenge <laughs> yeah. for every, yeah. like, you know, like that's also an exhausting way to live your yeah, life, by the way, course. I think, you know. Yeah, and but that's what Nothing I'm saying. Comes I don't for think free. there's one, I don't think there's one yeah. definitive answer yeah. we're looking for. I'm definitely more on the Johnny side of things. Yeah. Whereas if I think if I'd had the other outlook, I would have been well short of what I needed to be. Yeah. Really? Mm. What's your biggest strength and what's your greatest weakness? I think my biggest strength is my work ethic. Um, my biggest weakness is... Do you think there's a chance you're too hard on yourself? Yeah, well, yeah, p possibly that. Possibly, yeah. But as I say, I've, from that hardness drives a... Then a plan mm. to try and improve what I consider the weakness. Do, so, do you know what I mean? Yes. So, Since so, you got this job then, have you laid your head on the pillow at the end of the night and thought I've, that day was perfect? Yeah, no, no, no day is perfect. But I think you lay your head on the pillow going, I've given my all today. I can't, I couldn't have given any more. Mm. And I, I, I do sleep and I always have, I've slept very well. Even in some difficult moments where you're going, tomorrow's going to be tough. But I sleep well because I, I sort of go to bed knowing there's nothing more I can give. If you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? Yeah, I thought about this earlier because I knew this one was coming. And uh, I'm going to give two answers. I'm going to go back to before I was injured. So playing for Portsmouth, I, I lasted two games and it was a big injury and it ruined my career. I was never the same player after. So I wouldn't mind doing something different before that moment and giving myself a chance to have a different playing career. But then it, this wouldn't have happened afterwards. Mm. So I've got to be careful what I wish for there. The second one would be um, definitely a, a chance to speak to my mum before she passed away and to just tell her how grateful I was for everything she did for me. That was nice. Just going to pick you up on the, the point about... um. The injury. Yeah. It's a really good lesson, I think, this for lots of people to hear that, you know, sometimes the things that are the hardest in your life actually can lead to the the greatest moments in your life. Uh, am I right in saying that the energy that you have every single day now probably comes from the, the pain of your career being cut short? Yeah, poss possibly. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think I wouldn't have ended up navigating my way like I did through the early part of my management career. And I think that was fundamental to forming the manager I am now. Yeah. You know, the fact that I was thrust into it at 31 and the situation that we faced, there's so many good lessons there for me, you know, in terms of making the best out of no resources, um, galvanizing the players and a sort mm -hmm. of a journey, them against us type attitude. It was brilliant, brilliant learning for me, which I didn't really know at the time, but that came from having your, your career shut, cut short and having nowhere else to turn other than form a new career based on the sport you love. So really looking back, yeah, the the, the injury was, I think, a fortunate thing for me in the end. And talking about your mum, when you reflect on all the things that she did for you over the years, what what did she get right in terms of parenting that stood you in such good oh, stead? Great question. I think she just enabled me to express myself with no no boundary, no fear. If you want to be a footballer, that's your dream, go for it. If you want to be something else, go for it. I'll back you whatever you want to do. Th those types of messages, mm. um, uh, which I didn't know at the time. You sort of want someone, I, I felt I wanted someone to go, well, do this. And you go, okay. <laughs> but you, the, the, the actual freedom to choose was everything. And then once, once you have that and you, you have a childhood that's just full of, positive memories and laughter and um, playing. Yeah, I think you, you you got a good chance then to uh, have a good life. And you didn't get a chance to say thanks for all that, no? Well, I don't, I don't feel I did. I, I you know, my mum would know how I feel about her, but, you know, there's so many things when someone's gone that you, you think, ah, just wish I had, you know, I was managing Burnley at the time and even when she was ill, I was traveling up and back and, not really, I don't think at that stage, fully understanding the situation that I should have been by her bedside. But 
I think she knew I had a job to do and I think she would embrace that and want me to do it. But still part of you then feels, feels not, you know, not right for not, mm. uh, not behaving differently. And, and obviously you know that that can't be changed, but there are still people in your life who you must always remember to get that bit right with. You don't want any more of those regrets. You know? Well, I think that's why life uh, is an amazing way of teaching you um, things you should and shouldn't have done. And I think when you experience that for the first time, um, it certainly teaches you a valuable lesson. Yeah. And the final question, your last message really for people that have listened to this enlightening conversation about life in management, your one golden rule for a high performance life. Oh, do you know what? I've forgotten about the golden rule. I think that the, the, <laughs> um, the golden rule for me would be to, to learn and to learn by, like I have, I feel, learn from mistakes, learn from failures and embrace those failures, which sometimes can be very difficult to do but embrace them for, for positives because they ultimately form and shape you and change you in a positive way. But I think how you react to those moments. So like for me, when I finished my playing career, it could have been very easy to go for a different way. And relegation at Bournemouth can be very easy to have a different sort of outcome from those things, but you have to put them to bed and then you have to grow from them ultimately to, I think, come again. Brilliant. No problem. Thank you, Eddie. Probably said too much, but <laughs> no, yeah. yeah.